Well, we're live, ladies and gentlemen. Now, eight minutes and 30 seconds into this second hour, and I've had a chance to meet him in New York and interview him for my film, Martial Law. He was gracious enough to give us a few hours then, and I've had him on the radio with us many, many uh, times over the years, breaking big stories uh, that he's always gracious enough to bring us. And he was here over the weekend uh, speaking to a uh, standing room only crowd about his new book that just came out and is already on the New York Times bestseller list. It's Greg Palast, Armed Madhouse, Who's Afraid of Osama Wolf, China Floats, Bush Sinks, The Scheme to Steal 08, No Child Behind Left. And it also is a uh, handsome book. I just got it and I can't wait to read it. Greg is uh, an extremely accomplished uh, writer, again, best selling author joining us in studio. We're also videotaping this for the local TV show and the PrisonPlanet.tv viewers. Greg Powell, it's great to have you here with us. Terrific, Alex. It's always an honor, really. I mean, you know, my, uh, my big shot publishers out of New York, I say, I want to launch my book on the Alex Jones show. And they go, well, it's Alex Jones. You know, like they're in the New York Towers. They don't understand what the people are listening to. So that's why even they are surprised that my book is a bestseller again. Uh, you know, so thank you, Alex, because you're getting that word out. Oh, no, thank you, Greg. You uh, certainly have a huge grassroots support all over the globe. Tell us, tell us about Armed Madhouse. Well, I mean, it starts out like, who's afraid of Osama Wolf? You go from, you go from um, the war on terror to Iraq to Venezuela um, to China and what's going on uh, with all this stuff. What I'm doing is, for those who don't know me, I do um, investigative reporting for BBC television, which, you know, Alex is, uh, you know, I have to do over there because investigative reporting here is, I think, against Patriot Act 3 or something. They don't allow this stuff on the air. What I've got here, for example, are the secret uh, plans for the oil fields of Iraq, which I was able to get out of Houston, uh, which are written for the Iraqi government, imposed by the State Department, but written up by big oil. I've got here um, the inside documents from Choice Point and the companies which are illegally, you know, um, sucking up uh, information about you and me and, and renting it out to the government. Uh, so you, you have like 60 illustrations in this beast because it's all these documents marked secret and confidential you're not supposed to see. And BBC will actually allow me to go get them, but they won't allow me to show it on US TV. I am completely, totally locked out of uh, American uh, television. Well, this is smoking gun type stuff that yep. you have. You've done a lot of the original research on this. It's been confirmed. It's been vetted. Uh, right. This is the same stuff that the Treasury Secretary O'Neill was telling us. Then you actually get the documents. Right. This is this is war profiteering in the extreme. This is serious crime, in my opinion. And 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 historically, we have that precedent. You have the oil companies writing up the oil policy for the Iraqi government to basically then hand it over to them, proving that one of the pillars of this invasion uh, is about snatching trillions of dollars in oil. And controlling it. See, one of the weird things is, and one of the horrible things is, I got two documents. A lot of, you know, they say, oh, conspiracy nuts think that Bush had a secret plan to seize and control the oil fields of Iraq before the invasion and, uh, be, and even before uh, September 11th. And that's not true, Alex, because I looked it up and we dug it out and we found out he had two plans. And the two plans, one written up by neocons, one written up by Big Oil. And the Big Oil plan, which is the one that ultimately won out, is not about, believe it or not, it's not about going to get the oil. It's not about blood for oil. It's about blood for no oil. They're not going in there to get you the oil to make it cheap to fill your Hummer. They are going in. They're using the 82nd Airborne as uh, Exxon's exploration company, not to find oil and bring it back, but to find oil and turn off the spigots. You read, I had a 323-page document written by, up by Big Oil and the James Baker III Institute, Council on Foreign Relations. I know that a lot of people say, oh, this is conspiracy stuff. You have to understand, I found out these guys wrote up our policy because they told me themselves, the oil execs themselves, and the James Baker people. If you don't know James Baker, he was Secretary of State under Bush one Treasury Secretary under Ronald Reagan. He represents, he's the lawyer for Exxon Mobil, the lawyer for the Saudi Arabian government, and the lawyer kind of consigliere for the Bush family. And it's his crew that put this together. Now, they say that they didn't put it together, uh, or they say that they didn't even talk to me. But, and they threatened to sue, by the way, Harper's Magazine when I outed this stuff. Then the editor of Harper's said, you never talked to Palace? They said, that's right. And they said, okay, what part of this audio tape is not you? Because that's one thing I do. <laughs> now, I was on, on national uh, public radio, NPR, which are better called National Petroleum Radio. 
And they said, we don't do that. I said, I know that, but I have to. You know what? You talk to these guys, they lie. So they didn't know who they were talking to or why, and they let the stuff out. When I got the word about the oil companies drafting up the plans for Iraq's oil fields right out of Houston, even though it says Washington on it. First of all, they, by the way, the United States government told me in writing, when I say me, BBC television, they told us in writing there is no such plan. Defense Department, State Department, White House, in writing, there is no plan for the Iraqi oil industry that we have written. Then I get the plan, 323 pages, marked State Department, not for public distribution, uh, not uh, you know confidential, the whole nine yards. And I got that by wiring up and talking to the oil execs who described it and I was able to get my hands on it. But here's the evil thing of what's in it. Bad enough that you got oil company executives writing a policy attached to an Abrams tank. And we got kids out there. We got now two kids being held hostage, one out of Houston, right? And believe me, the kid from Houston who's held hostage didn't have anything to do with writing up these oil plans. The oil plans are about, the, here's the phrase in it, you'll love this. The purpose is to, quote, enhance Iraq's relationship with OPEC. Guys, OPEC is the oil cartel, which is squeezing us by the pumps, destroying our economy, raising the price of oil to 70 bucks a barrel, that's three bucks a gallon, at the pump. Enhance OPEC. And just so you know, when you talk about crime, Alex, you have to understand it is against the law for any American to participate in the oil cartel, in any cartel, okay? Uh, King Abdullah gets away with having a cartel because, uh, you know, there's an exception to American law saying, you know, that apparently that, you know, dictators and bathrobes and crowns are not part of, uh, they're not subject to our laws of monopoly. Yeah, the foreign governments who have kings, they're allowed to have monopolies, but in the U.S. going back to 1906 and the Sherman Antitrust Act, you can't do that. That's right. In fact, there's something called the long arm of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is that any monopoly anywhere, including OPEC, is against the U.S. law. If any American is, is found helping out OPEC, now, of course, the oil companies are, are cranking it in big time because of OPEC, and they pretend to have nothing to do with it. But now we have a document showing that the James Baker people and the oil companies that worked with them, like Petromina out of in, in Indonesia, for example, was in it on it, that these guys are, in, they, they're using their own phrase, that they're enhancing OPEC, that they're trying to maneuver Iraq to make sure that Iraq will never bust the Saudi Arabian production quotas. Or Saudi Arabia sets quotas. You can't produce th more oil than, than 3 million barrels a day for Iraq. That's their absolute stone limit. Now, a lot of people I know think that George Bush screwed up in Iraq. You read these documents, you realize he hasn't. Because, you know, when he came into office, oil was 20-something a barrel, like cheaper than peanut butter. Today, it's 70 bucks a barrel. That's mission accomplished. You read this stuff, that was their mission, mission accomplished. Greg, let me add something to what you just said, because this is incredible. You know, obviously, I've read your last two books. I've uh, watched your Bush Family Fortunes video. It's excellent. But the things you're saying here, I mean, this is the documents. This is the evidence. You, right you've here. gotten IMF World Bank documents in the past. I want to well, revisit some, some of that here, because, yeah. because it ties in. But uh, the neocons get on talk radio and go, look, less oil is flowing out of Iraq. See, if we wanted the oil, it'd be flowing. No, 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 no. It's called artificial scarcity. You got it. Ladies and gentlemen. And, and it's the same thing the Beers and the Oppenheimers do with diamonds. They go all over the world buying up the fields, paying people off, sending in mercenaries, bragging about it, because they're actually only semi-precious. They artificially make them scarce. And it's the same thing with Iraq. In fact, in 1990... They were angry. Uh, uh, OPEC, Bush, uh, Senior, and others were, uh, Europe was angry that Saddam was, quote, overproducing, driving oil prices down because he said, hey, I've got a 30 something billion dollar debt to BCCI and, and other people. I've got to pay this off. Right. OPEC said, you're driving it down to 90 cents a gallon. You can't do this. So they set him up. He said, okay, well, they're slant drilling. Can I invade them? Yeah. We don't get involved in inter Arab affairs. April Gillespie, we, uh, we don't have a defense treaty with them. So, so understand, ladies and gentlemen, grabbing the oil in Afghanistan and then controlling Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, the other stands, Turkmenistan, that means China and India don't get it. See, it's about grabbing it and then sitting on it. You got it. You know what? I can't, you know what? That's, I'm glad you grabbed it, Alex, because there were a lot of people, you know, kind of in the streets saying no blood for oil. And there was this whole image that we were going there to get the oil. And like you say, the neocons say, hey, we didn't get the oil, so obviously that's not what it was about. It's about not getting the oil. It's about capping it. 
not getting it. In fact, it goes back, by the way, this is interesting, you'll find the book. And, and by the way, one thing I do in the book, there's like 70 documents shown here. And, and you know, I try to do it, by the way, in a way that's humorous. You know, that's how you do news in the BBC. You can have a little humor. But you actually have the enhanced OPEC document in there. Um, but one thing you'll find out that's interesting is going back in history. Iraq was invented to control oil. Winston Churchill invented Iraq in 1920. And they set up a nation. They got in a guy named Faisal as king. Winston Churchill took the Kirkuk fields, the Basra fields, and the tar sands of Baghdad, put the three fields together, called it Iraq, invited in a guy named Faisal from Saudi Arabia, said, you're king. He said, king of what? He said, Iraq. He said, what's Iraq? He said, it's a place in Baghdad. And, and that's why the Saudis have always been our buzz, uh, buddies. It goes back to Lawrence of Arabia. They just went and picked a tribe, gave them a bunch of machine guns and grenades, and said, you're the bosses there. And, and we got you. And so what happened was is that Faisal then flipped around and gave a concession to a consortium, uh, to a consortium including Anglo-Persian, which is now BP, uh, Standard Oil, now Exxon, a company that's now Total France and Royal Dutch Shell. Those four operators, in 1925, they sat in a hotel room in Brussels, laid out a map of the Mideast, took a red marker, no, they didn't have markers, they took a red pen and put a circle around Syria and Iraq. Every oil company executive in the room in 25 signed that on the red line on the big map and agreed never to pull oil out of Iraq. Greg Palace, this is riveting. Well, we're going to come right back. He's got the documents. It's in the new book, Armed Madhouse. It's going to be a good one. Already on the New York Times bestseller list. Stay with us. Greg Palace in studio. Greg, this is incredible. You have the oil company documents yep. where they're openly talking about stopping the flow. You expose peak oil as a big PR scam to make us think there's not enough oil to, to again, create the illusion of artificial scarcity. You've got it all in here. But before we get into that, uh, in, in 95 and 96, a bunch of documents were produced by the oil companies. In 2001, the Associated Press reported on it, and it came back out last year where they said, we've got to buy up these hundreds of independent refineries in North America because there's too much oil. We can create an artificial bottleneck by buying them up. Then they blame the environmentalists and say, oh, it's all their fault. You know, it, it's, They're the reason that all the refineries have been shut down when we have their own smoking gun documents. Greg, how do they get away with this? How do they get away with it? Well, because they... Uh do you realize that ExxonMobil is the second largest lifetime career giver to George W. Bush and the Bush family uh, after Enron, okay? I mean, you have to understand uh, who's, who's uh, you know, who's bought the White House for these guys. And, and, you know, look, also, you know, you can't ignore the fact that these are the guys who shoplifted the White House. And the same guys that helped them shoplift the White House are the same guys, the same companies who are collecting the lists on Americans for the war on terror. And that's all about you collect the lists, you know, everyone's worried about the civil liberties aspect. I keep asking a simple question. What are they doing with these lists? They sure as heck aren't going after the, uh, the bad guys, the terrorists. Uh, they're going after, you know, we're the victims on September 11th, not the suspects. They made us the suspects. We're under surveillance. They can't do this legally. It's against the law. And by the way, the law is the United States Constitution. So what they do is they have companies like Choice Point and others collecting the information on us, private KGB-type operations, then they rent the data from them. To fund and it. To, to, and Yeah, and then what happens is once they rent the data, what's it used for? It's used for elections. And then they even make, their buddies even make money off the scam. Oh, they really? don't just steal, and again, Billions. and then meanwhile, the Democratic Party. No bid contracts. The Democratic Party's bought off by the same people. We're, oh, yeah. Uh, now, now, I mean, even Sandra Day. No, no, you know, you can't buy Democrats. You can only rent them. <laughs> uh, I mean, even Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, even Bob Woodward, all these people, are uh, Ron Paul, Congressman, they're all saying we're in danger of a dictatorship. They say Bush, with the signing statements, uh, saying he's above the law. Uh, John Yu, Alberto Gonzalez, saying he is the law, the Fuhrer yeah. principle. Can you speak to the fact, I mean, Greg Palace, yeah. are we in danger of having uh, some form of a dictatorship? Well, it's a slow motion, soft dictatorship. In other words, when these guys start surveilling us, Okay, and it's against the Constitution, and and they by order say that the that the any law is subject to presidential uh, um, elimination by signature. Any of your rights? And what is a dictatorship except one guy's one a dictatorship by definition is one guy saying I can set the laws, I can ignore these laws, and I can accept those laws. When one man is above the laws, that is the definition of dictatorship. 
Getting into uh, this particular document yeah. here in front of me from page 99, enhanced government relationship with OPEC, uh, USA will maintain the contents confidential, should not That's be right. reproduced, distributed, or used. What does this document uh, specifically cover? Okay, that what that document is covering, and, and it's part of the 300-page document. This is part of that document developed by the big oil companies for the Iraq development of the Iraq oil fields and, and the Iraq oil industry. And it's all about, it's not about selling the oil fields. The, the other plan I have, the neocons had a plan to say, sell off the oil fields. And big oil said, that ain't how you do it. And by the way, you know, the guys I spoke to, you have to understand, are not low-level guys. I spoke to people like Phil Carroll, who's uh, CEO of Shell Oil. And, you know, again, a lot of these people didn't realize I was wired. By the, uh, by the way, Carroll was at the Bilderberg Group meeting uh last week and, and and I was there and I got I got picked up interrogated other people that were there got picked up and asked if they were terrorists and stuff so are you <laughs> no but I mean it, it, <laughs> are you now or have you ever been but it's getting scary I mean, this yeah. stuff's really happening yeah well you know it's 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 fascinating though to, to talk to these oil guys <coughs> I mean they're deeply concerned that um, Saddam was out of control as they put it that he was jerking the oil markets up and down and now I have you know I have the uh, also in the book the maps of Iraq and it's oil fields that Dick Cheney went over with oil company executives in March of 2001. You have to understand, that's within six weeks of the inauguration, guys. This is no September 11th attack or anything. We already had the maps out of the oil Well, he told attack. his biographer in 99, I'm going to attack Iraq, I'm going to be a war president, and I'm paraphrasing the quote, but this is almost it. He, he said, a war president cannot be questioned domestically. So, so it's about hundreds of billions in no-bid contracts and weapon sales. It's about restricting the trillions in oil to then make hundreds of billions a year off that. It's yeah. incredible. Uh, well, you know, and some of the stuff, like the the uh, the review, of the, as I find out, the oil fields of Iraq were being reviewed by who was in the room. It was not only oil company executives, Council of Foreign Relations, and Ken Lay, of all people. And that's because they were going over what people thought is that they were rewriting the energy laws of the U.S. That was a very minor part of it. I now know it was the total energy plan for the planet. And, and they talked about what they called, quote, and this is a quote, military option for Iraq. This is March 2001. This is before 9-11. Way before. When we get back, we've got a long segment, plenty of time to talk. I want to get into what this global plan is because you've got the 300-page uh, document, and, and that can give us a window into what's going to happen in the future, what the neocons want, what the oil companies want, how these two different bodies, uh, you know, how their program converges, where it differs, mm -hmm. and... Uh, and how Europe ties into all this, what you see happening in the future. Greg Pallast in studio. We've got Greg Pallast in studio with us, the new book, Armed Madhouse. And he's the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy, Armed Madhouse. Who's afraid of Osama Wolf? China floats, Bush sinks. The scheme to steal 08, no child behind left. Uh, I want to get into their big plan in the future, what you know from talking to these executives and... Right and 300-page document, but right now you have done something bold here because the left is in love with what I've tracked back to be oil company propaganda, and, and it, it's like a religion. They, all over uh, Austin, all over New York, when I traveled to these cities, when I was in Canada, peak oil, peak oil, there's no more oil, I we're know. all dead, you know, we have to pay $500 a gallon, it's all over. Uh, we're running out of crude, dude. I mean, one of the problems is, Alex, and, and I lost a lot of my supporters, and I'm sorry about this, but I'm an investigative reporter, so I investigated peak oil. What I found out is that it was created by Shell Oil, and I call it the Shell Game in here, by a guy named Hubbard, who is the chief geologist for Shell. And Shell Queen was, Beatrix. Is, yeah, yeah. And, and Shell was trying, uh, was panicked because they were finding all this new oil in the Mideast, and, you know, and so what are they going to do? So they announced, instead of that, God, we got a lot of new oil, they said, well, it looks like we've got a lot of new oil, but you know, it's going to run out. It's going to peak. It's going to just suddenly collapse on us. And now the latest thing that I found, by the way, Alex, and I show it in the book, inside the Department of Energy, inside the Department of Energy is a document showing that while, yes, we are beginning, we're going to start running to the end of Saudi Arabia's oil. It's not going to be so quick, by the way. Um, that if you add in what they call the Orinoco extra heavy oil, that that reserve and 90% of it's in Venezuela, that reserve is five times bigger than the Saudi Arabian reserve. Five, so we are swimming in this stuff. And this is their own internal documents that they don't want right. the public to know about. And I, by the way, they called BBC Television London. When I put it on TV, they said, where'd you get that document? And I said, we don't remember. <laughs> but see, we, I can't do that in US TV. I can't take an inside document that I find about all this oil, and the Department of Energy knows it. Why shouldn't we know it? Why is it a secret? It's not a secret to the oil companies. It's not a secret to our government. 
I know, it, it, just, it just makes me become speechless to have the documents in front of me, to see the same documents, to, to, to track back peak oil when it first started getting promoted six, seven, eight years ago, to see that it was being uh, financed through these uh, shell grants to Russian scientists, to see that it emanated from one of their uh, chief of, of petroleum geologists. I have family who are petroleum geologists. Uh, my family has worked in the oil fields, you know, from the level of roughnecks to the level of uh, chief engineers running huge refineries uh, in Houston. And we, about five, six years ago, I first started learning about peak oil, and I knew it was a fraud then. I started talking to family, and they said, it is the biggest joke on the world. Well, we have so much oil, they're finding it in the North Sea, they're finding it in Russia, they're finding it, it's in India, it's in China. Oil is, it's all in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Mexico itself has three times the oil of the lower 48 in the U.S. Mexico, uh, Pemex, I mean, I mean you're... Nothing comes close to Venezuela, and that's one of the reasons why they want to kill Hugo Chavez. I was just down meeting with the president of Venezuela. Oh, tell us month. about that. Yeah, last month. So I showed him the, you know, the... Department of Energy material saying he had more oil than Saudi Arabia. He said, well, I, I, hey, Greg, I know that. Uh, what he was saying, though, what he was concerned about is that, um, you know, obviously you had the Reverend Pat Robertson saying, oh, uh, Hugo Chavez, he's the president of Venezuela, thinks you're trying to assassinate him. Well, I think we should just go ahead and do it. They're afraid. Oh, I love that. He's paranoid saying they want to kill him, but they're on the news saying kill him. Four days after you came on my show in 2002, on my show, it's in my book, Is It in the Tyranny, the transcript. That transcript got put in a bunch of foreign newspapers. It went you know, supernova, yes. uh, as we say. You said there's going to be a coup in the next few months. Four days later, they kidnap him. But, but uh, I want to go back over that, but, right. but, but uh, I interrupted. Tell us, you met with the president. Tell us. Okay, so I met with the president. And uh, by the way, that was very helpful, the, your show, because it, one of the things that he credits with saving his life, because they kidnapped him, and obviously the next move was to kill him. But by, but by getting out the word that he was in fact kidnapped, that it was an illegal coup d'etat, the U.S. State Department said he had resigned, was in despair, and of course they're going to say he committed suicide or something like that. Uh, because it was a lie, and it was exposed, it saved his life. And so that's very, you know, getting the word out can be very important. But the important thing is that he's sitting on all this oil. He said, look, I'd like to cut a deal with the American people. I said, I'm not going to cut the deal with Bush. I'll cut the deal with the American people. Let's cut the price of oil by a good third right now. Knock a buck a gallon off your gas. I'll give cheap heating oil to all the cities in America, all low-income areas, to every fuel co-op in America permanently. But, one, we've got to end the, the kind of cold war that they're starting against Latin America. Uh, that's got to stop. The other is that he said, you got to get rid of Saudi, con in effect, get rid of Saudi control of OPEC because, you know, OPEC is, um, is he has this game where they shoot the price of oil way, way up through the ceiling. And about every six, eight years, they dump it down to nothing to wipe out alternatives. And he says, I can't operate, in, you know, the, our nation's getting killed this way with the up and down. Stabilize the price of oil. we got plenty of oil for you. Let's work it out. And, and Bush's response, the, the, this government's response, big oil, and by the Democratic Party too, both parties are in on this, um, is kill them. Uh, then we're not going to tolerate that. And one of the big reasons, by the way, is that he said, look, Abdullah gives you all his money back. Basically, almost all the petrodollars, all the big money we spend on our oil goes out to the Mideast, through the oil companies, out to the Mideast, and back into the U.S. Treasury so that uh, we've run up a $2 trillion debt, Alex, uh, extra since Bush has come in, $2 trillion. That's all been borrowed abroad, every single penny. Petrodollars are the key. Chavez said, I will give you cheap petroleum, but I'm not going to lend George Bush back money for oil wars. I'm, you know, I'm not doing that. In fact, he took $20 billion out of the U.S. Federal now, Reserve. Now, now, tell me if I'm wrong, but, but I've been following this and following your reportage and others. He, he said, I'll give it to you at about uh, you know, 10%, 90% uh, off. Then uh, even some of the oil companies and, and, and the people that would distribute it on the East Coast, they said, no, how about 60% off? So that's what they ended up doing. Uh, now uh, Chavez has reversed and said, fine, if the oil companies say, if I cut oil prices, you're just going to uh, restrict your production, fine, you won't let me do the deal, then I'm going to start taxing the oil companies uh, a modest amount when you explore uh, and, and uh, develop here for my people, and, and it's a very small percentage, now they're going even crazier. Yes, well, one of the things is he doubled the royalties on, uh, on the oil companies. So obviously they weren't too happy about that. And, um, you know, but on the other hand, they still keep 70% and the stuff's worth 70 bucks a barrel. I was about to say before the... the they're paying 16%. In fact, they had some contracts in 1% royalty. 1% royalty. I mean, you know, this is starvation for these people. 
So he's building, he's building nations. He's also lending it to the nations like Ecuador, et cetera, because what he says is we have to eliminate. One of the reasons why they're out to get him, he says, we have to eliminate the IMF. We have to replace it with the International Humanities Fund. He said the International Monetary Fund is, is you know, basically uh, a financial dictatorship. And it is killing. And you got their own documents on that? Yes. In fact, in the book, I have the documents that, that were just an absolute wipeout for the nation of Ecuador. And it wasn't Ecuador. Uh, basically, this was to help out these bond speculators. Everyone knew that these guys were a bunch of criminals. And, but the IMF was backing up these bond speculators who were demanding a bonus, a bonus payoff from Ecuador. And the president of Ecuador met with me. He said, if we pay this level of debt, I mean, our nation is destroyed. If we're dead, who's going to pay them off? I mean, it's going to destroy our But nation. you have the IMF World Bank documents. Yeah. Joseph Stiglitz, our chief economist, went public. In there, they say it's about destroying countries. Yeah. They say it's about creating poverty because, again, these elites are monopoly men. It isn't about a free market, ladies and gentlemen. They're not free market. Just they like... Free market. Uh, just like a free market. Just you like uh, General Smedley Butler said, war is a racket. He said, I was a you know highly paid mercenary who was sent into these countries uh, for big moneyed interests. So, so understand, they're threatened by you having a good economy. They're threatened by you being solvent. Look at it here in the U.S. Everything is designed to get us into, uh, into yeah. debt. This is a predatory economy. Can you speak to that? Yes, absolutely. There is a section in there. You have to understand, King Abdullah rent, has lent us a trillion bucks for, out of Saudi Arabia. We're lending back our own money. In other words, we get charged big time. Think of it as an oil tax at the pump which goes out through Exxon, out to uh, Saudi Arabia, and back. Now, as you know, the Koran prohibits the charging of interest. But King Abdullah doesn't mind grabbing a big pound of flesh from us. And, and also the Chinese are big, big lenders, about uh, almost uh, two-thirds of a trillion dollars at this point. And the result is these extra high interest rates in the U.S., which has been killing off the auto industry, killing off the airline industry, and you have to understand, these are, you know, unionized, uh, high-wage industries, which are now becoming low-wage industries. And frankly, I, you know, that's mission accomplished. These guys aren't shedding a tear. Why don't they stop it? They're not shedding a tear. Why, why not cut the deal with Chavez? Cheap oil, lots of it. Tell the Sa Saudis to go fly. But instead, we got our president, right, you know, chauffeuring around King Abdullah and his golf cart at the Crawford Ranch. Now, now the globalists are long-term players. These deals that we still live under were made in the Middle East. Uh, over 80 years ago, That's right. uh, when Mohammed Mosaddegh, Man of the Year, Time Magazine, humanitarian, poet, pro-America, kicked the communist out of his country, Kermit Roosevelt, before he died, went on NPR and admitted that our government carried out terror attacks uh, uh, in Iran to then blame it on Mosaddegh. They put him on house arrest, cut his minister's heads off. Can you speak to specifically what oh, happened yeah. in Iran? One of the, that was, man, that's a grim situation. In, 19, in the 1950s, um, Mossadegh, the president, the elected president of Iran, nationalized the oil companies. Uh, then the U.S. and Britain went on a, a campaign to, a successful campaign to overthrow his elected government. And if you read the CIA documents, which have now been declassified, National Security Archive, you really got to go to these, Alex. The horrible thing is... It's in my new film, yeah. You know, they, the Shah of Iran, who took over, actually didn't want to overthrow the elected government. He was scared. So the CIA said, what we have to do is activate the Islamic mullahs who have been out of politics activate them and convince them that democracy is un-Islamic. So that's right in those documents at the, at the National And that Security goes back Archive. to the Muslim Brotherhood over right. and over again. So, so what they're doing is we created, the CIA created this fanatic Muslim anti-democratic bent. It was a creation to get rid of the elected government, which had taken over the oil companies. And well, now they flew in Ayatollah Khomeini yeah. uh, uh, there in the late 70s, and then they had a weapons deal with him, and then Clinton gives $45 million dollars. Uh, to Iran to help attack the Serbs uh, in 1998, 1999. Uh, Greg, can you speak to that? I mean, sometimes I think that uh, well, Ahmed Dinajad may be on some type of globalist payroll. I mean, because I see piece after piece. Uh, you're getting you're getting close on that one. Mad Mahmoud is part of the game. It's a Punch and Judy show. Watch, Alex. Every time the price of oil gets towards 60 bucks a barrel, suddenly Mad Mahmoud out there in Tehran says, "We're going to blow up Israel." Or, and or next time it drops, he goes, "We're going to. We got bugs and bombs." And then if it drops again, Bush says, oh, we're going to go get him. And each time, either Bush or Mad Mahmoud says something, the price of oil is up another five to eight bucks a barrel. You have to look at the timing of those statements. It's a punch and Judy show. The guy that they're worried about is Chavez of Venezuela. Well, let's talk about that, though, for a second, and then let's go back to it, Greg. Right. Uh, I mean, we, we know that our government allowed them to fly an Ayatollah Khomeini. 
We know Reagan then and Bush Sr. made backroom deals with him to get Jimmy Carter out. We know that they used him to attack the Serbs. Who, I'm not, and then Iran Contra, I mean, my God. I mean, that we gave, we literally gave guns to the Ayatollah. Do you think they're on secure sat phones, uh, you know, having briefings? In this, I mean, how staged is it? I, I think it's extraordinarily staged. But I think also, I mean, you know, the other problem is, is that these things get out of control. And we have to be very careful about it. This is really playing with fire. Just like when... Well, that's what the globalists do. That's what the Bushies do. They, all, they, they set people up. I know, but you know what? The problem is, is that we created this fanatic, Islamic, politicized force, dangerous force, which wasn't there before. They had an elected government of Iran. We overthrew him because he grabbed the oil fields, and we empowered these maniac mullahs. Well, I mean, I, I actually looked the documents up, and I have Kermit Roosevelt's after-action reports to Tim Downing Street like they're his boss, and to uh, President Eisenhower... And uh, he wasn't asking for that much of the BP oil. He was just saying, can we keep some of it? That's right. Same with Chavez. He's saying, look, let us keep, we want 30%, not 16%. And these 1% deals have got to go. Okay. So he, you know, and he said, that's, that's the deal. We, you can't squeeze our nation. We can't be an oil colony forever. I mean, we, there are people in car, living in a million people living in cardboard shacks around Caracas. And so he charged the oil companies, and now you don't see those cardboard Same companies. thing, Mexico City, 30-something million people, half of them living in cardboard boxes, folks. I've seen it. And, I mean, that's and how they've, these... got, they've got all this oil oil. And, and you know, they got to keep some of it. The problem is, is that for the average American, what are we getting out of it? We're getting it. They squeeze the oil. We're paying high price at the pump, high interest rates. Our manufacturing industries are, are, are going down the tube with this stuff. I mean, it is not for our benefit. So, so the economy is being looted. Uh, I want to specifically then talk about in the future. You've made really good predictions here. You said Chavez in the next month to two months. In fact, I've got the quote in my book. I can dig it out. Yeah. Uh, ju just type uh, Greg Palast, Alex Jones, World Bank IMF documents into Google. It'll come up. Well, uh, but uh, you said the next few months they're going to coo him. You were right. What are you predicting there? And then where, what do you see happening to George Bush and the neocon agenda? Is it going to stall? It looks like it's starting to stall. Or does it have enough momentum to keep moving? Well, a couple things. I'm, I don't know if I'm good at prognosticating it. The information about the coup is because I had inside information about the coup. So I, I'm more investigative. And what we're finding now is that the neocons, yeah, are, bit, are in twilight right now because they, look, when they're trying to grab the assets of Iran, that was one thing. When they try to grab the oil fields without the permission of the oil companies and have their own scheme, they got slapped around big, big. So you big agree plan. with some of the other inside experts we've got that there is a, a, a starting, split. starting to be a split? Yeah, there's a split between big oil and the neocons. The, the big oil has a big long-term picture. And, um, you know, they're not, big oil ain't talking about democracy in the Mideast. They're talking about controlling those oil fields and, as to use their phrase, enhancing OPEC, making sure that no one busts the quotas. You know, I'm looking, unfortunately, I would say the <coughs> obvious thing for these guys to do is to assassinate the president of Venezuela. I mean, uh, you know, that's, it, unfortunately, that's an obvious thing for them to do. Uh, we are now in a virtual Cold War with all of Latin America. And, and there's troops in a whole bunch of countries down this there. This is a very dangerous business right now. Every, you know, everyone's looking to the Mideast. Get ready, guys. The big Cold War, the big, and we're going to see, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to move in with the 82nd Airborne because those people will shoot back. It's not going to be like, you know, like, like fun and games, like uh, Desert Storm. Uh, so that's not going to happen, but it's all going to be through puppet uh, coup d'etat action. And, you know, we cannot let a guy with, with bigger reserves than Saudi Arabia start cutting deals that don't involve the oil companies. I mean, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, he's threatening, he's threatening Saudi hegemony of OPEC. He's threatening. Uh, and now he's got his own uh, type of uh, coalition or alliance down there. These countries getting together. So, so what's the time frame? I don't know. Cause you know, obviously the, the big oil guys, I didn't get enough information from them. I mean, I can only have so much access. But we know they're increasing it. troop levels right now. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, uh, that one thing big oil does not like is too much turmoil unless they've set it off. And, you know, but again, playing with fire, you know, once you set up, once you start playing games with, uh, with the Iranians, it can get out of control. These guys, I don't see how they can control these fires that they set. But That's, hasn't big oil set bushes and them up kind of their wind-up toys to take the fall later? I mean, they do that a lot. I mean, it is James Baker and Daddy and all them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that, that little George is, is going to, they're going to load all the negatives on him. The, the, the war, everything else. The war is going the way that they want it. Oil's at 70 bucks a barrel, but someone's got to take a fall. Well, they call it the strategy of balkanization. I have an Israeli document, 1983, Pentagon documents, 2002. They say they want it broken into three or four parts. Now I hear NPR announcing this like it's some new strategy. Oh, we could break it up in pieces. They wanted sectarian division. They don't want any sovereign nations. Well,
Well, in fact, when I talked to General Jay Garner, as you'll see in the book, General Jay was our was our first viceroy that we put in charge, Alex. And uh, in, in our madhouse, I actually met with him. And, uh, you know, he was saying it, we could have had peace between these factions, but obviously they didn't want it. No, they didn't. Greg Powell, let's stay there. We'll be right back after this quick break. We will uh, continue. There's so much in this book. I haven't read it yet, but just scanning over it, I think this. You'll enjoy it. You'll get a kick. I think this blows. Uh, I mean, just from looking at it, the uh, the spectrum of data in it, I think this blows. Best democracy money can buy away. It does. It does. That's yeah. from the author. We'll be right back. Uh, Greg, looking at this, there's so many things that you've right. done in this book that really impressed me. I've been scanning over it during the breaks. You tackled peak oil. I want to spend a few minutes getting into that because don't liberals out there or progressives or conservatives. Don't we all just want the truth? Don't we want to know the truth? Not some lie that we've accepted as the truth becomes some religious orthodoxy. Peak oil is a scam, is a fraud, is a hoax, and I'm sick of it. Can you specifically, as we end this hour, speak to the evidence, the chapter in the book on this, and how now some of your, some of your grassroots people uh, are now mad at you? Hey, folks, Greg doesn't lie to you. He does the research. I'm kind of stuck. You know, I mean, I, I went into the peak oil situation just to see what that was about and what I found is that, you know, it was basically put together by Shell Oil to convince us, number one, that oil is scarce, so it's got to be much more expensive. Because remember, at, when they came out with peak oil, there, it was already down to a nickel a gallon and dropping. Shell was in a panic. So they announced, well, it looks like we got a lot, but we're about to run out of it. Uh, the second is to convince you that we need to secure the supply. You mean raw oil, crude? Oil, you mean right. Raw crude was a nickel a gallon. Sorry, start over. Yeah, but the gasoline is not. But this is 1956. Exactly. And uh, and and that we have to protect our. And that because it's scarce, we have to protect our supplies, which means the takeover of Iran, the the overthrow of Mossadegh, the control of Iraq, the whole thing. Even a lot of conservatives, either they say, "Oh, we don't want the oil sea; it's not being pumped." Well, that's artificial scarcity. Then the other camp of neocon, fake conservatives, because they're not real conservatives, they say, "Oh, yeah, we need that oil, peak oil." Conservatives have bought into it. Well, the other thing that's happening is that, look, I understand why environmentalists kind of like the idea of peak oil because they say, look, we're running out, so we better move to something else. We better move to something else for two other reasons. Number one, it's filthy, okay? Number two um, is that we don't want to be oil slaves. We don't need to be oil this slaves. This is a monopoly run by monopoly men, and it gives yeah. incredible power to these cartels. But, but, but Greg, yeah. when you go to these, you know, But I can't, but, I, but the problem is I would don't, yeah, I don't want to be an oil slave. I don't want to be sucking soot and have my kids suck soot. But that doesn't mean that we're running out of oil, guys. We have to tell the truth about this. We are floating in this stuff. Plus, it's designed to keep us in the oil monopoly. Yeah. And then transfer all of our wealth, using it as the only world currency, using oil as a world currency, forcing us to use that world currency, and then jacking up the prices so more and more of our economy goes into funding these guys, which then they put back into the till to get even more control. No one's explained to me why oil companies would tell us, hide the fact that uh, we're running out of oil. Less oil, the higher the price. The less oil, the higher the price. We'll be right back. Greg Palast in studio for two more segments. Coming up in the next segment, we're going to go to your calls at 800-259-9231. Mike, Sarah, Joe, Mike, and others. Greg, I'm impressed. I mean, just flipping through your new book, Our Madhouse, uh, it, is, it, it is really impressive. And, I, and I, I can tell you right now, I do want to carry this. I mean, just for the peak oil chapter alone, you've got the documents on the oil companies. Let's shift gears to what George Bush and his handlers really are. I mean, I've interviewed Ann Coulter, and I would say, well, Section 802 of the Patriot Act says that all Americans are basically terrorists. And she says, no, it doesn't. You're a liar. And then she says, I haven't read the Patriot Act, but she wrote it. <laughs> but she yeah, wrote right. several chapters in a book about it. And I mean, literally, I mean, I have congressmen, senators, Nobel Prize winners on, the best journalist. I mean, I, I don't consider myself to be real smart, but I have a lot of smart people on, so I'm pretty informed. She was one of the stupidest people I've ever talked to. Yeah, and and they true. talked about how smart she was and all this. And then she attacks the widows of 9-11 just to get publicity. And, 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 and she looks like this ring wraith type, type creature. And again, it's not about Ann Coulter, folks. It's about the fact that Time Magazine, everybody promotes her. Why are they promoting? this monster who has said stuff like we need to kill more innocent Iraqis. Uh, well, it's more fun and games and distraction, Alex. Look, when Greg Palace goes on BBC television and says, here's the inside documents from the oil industry for Iraq, when I show you the, the documents on the theft of the election, when I show you the, the documents from uh, inside the, uh, the Homeland Security uh, operations, well, you, that's what you have on, on the world TV, but in the United States you've got Ann Coulter, uh, talking about the godless uh, terrorists that were killed by the terrorists, you know. I mean, so, you know, 
So what happens, it's fun and games and distractions. It's info distraction. So she's meant to be over the top. She's a carnival barker. Yeah. No, she's part of the game. She's, you know, they, you know, they, uh, she's part, you know, she's total distraction. You know, she's total distraction. Well, I never really talk about her. It's just that I read the, it's all lies. And, and, and I mean, at the same time, there's a lot of horrible stuff liberals are doing, their establishment. I'm not a liberal, folks. I'm a paleo-conservative. I mean, I'm a constitutionalist. But by any yardstick, Bush has spent more money than all presidents combined. He's doubled the size of the BATF, signed back on to UN treaties, done all these, he's for totally open borders. Uh, he constantly lies. And still, so-called conservatives worship him and worship Ann Coulter, who's a low-grade moron. Well, I mean, what she is, is is she is a front person for um, of the control regime. Words, what she is selling us is the whole, she's bringing back the whole fear agenda. That's what they are. These are fear salesmen. That's what they're trying to sell you. Be afraid. You know, uh, that's what they want you to do. Well, I am afraid of the government, not them. Yeah, but, you know, it's like, that's why I call the first chapter, Who's Afraid of Osama Wolf? It's a game. Okay, they got a guy in a cave who's out to get you. Well, we have Buzzy Krongard, who was executive director of the CIA, telling the Times of London, oh, we know where he is, but we don't want him. Did yeah. you see that? Well, you know, uh, look, Clinton turned him down when they had him cornered in Khartoum. Uh, you know, you have to remember that, uh, you know, once again, they sell, the, the guy that's holding all our lists is uh, this guy, Derek Smith, who's chairman of uh, Choice Point Corporation. By the way, he's now under investigation for insider trading. And for uh, you know, failing to tell uh, his stockholders that uh, his company had given out the 145,000 uh, personal files to to uh, um, identity thieves, the ring of identity thieves. These are really nice guys, right? Uh, so what's happened is, is that he said, you know, if we only had these lists of Americans and your DNA too, we could have gotten the hijackers when they came to the airports to check in. Well, guys, you know what? The hijackers no longer use their names, even if they lose their frequent flyer miles. I mean, it's unbelievable. He said, well, you know, they used their real names. And if we only had the big databases, we could have got them. You know, it's just well, number like, one, they had those databases to begin with. It, so we know the NSA picked it all up. Bush spiked it with W199I. That's in BBC News. And still people are in denial, okay. even when FBI agents go public saying, I was ordered not to stop these people. We have FBI agents on the record saying it. And I've got neocon talk show hosts going, Alex Jones manufactured all this. Do you ever get tired of having the actual admissions and documents? And then they're saying it doesn't matter, it doesn't exist? I know. They say, well, your unprovable conspiracy theories. I say it's the facts and documents we put on BBC television. My God, it's the most number one stature network on the planet. What do you want from me? And they still won't put it on. They, they keep The New York Times said conspiracy material. Why don't, you know, well, the, well, the New York Times tells conspiracies about aluminum tubes and yellow cake. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, they're that's the official. Ones with, they're the ones with reporters on the payroll of the government. Final segment with Greg Palace. We're going to be taking your calls here in just a minute or two. I think Greg's got to go catch a plane for a big event he's going to be having in Houston. My last question for you before we go to calls, and you can add anything else you'd like mm -hmm. that, that you haven't had a chance to cover. Really, where is it all going? Will these guys ever get impeached? Will they go to jail? Will they get in trouble? Because I've studied American history. I've studied world history. I don't claim to be a historian, but I know quite a bit about it, more than most. And I've, I've never, and I mean this, folks, you know I hate Bill Clinton, attacked him ceaselessly, so did Greg. I mean, all these guys have been serious crooks in the past, uh, really since they killed Kennedy. And there were some crooks before him, but the wild level, I don't, I don't know if you saw this, Greg, but... Uh, you know, John Yu, White House counsel, says we can torture kids in front of their parents, crushing their... You know, and I keep bringing that up on the show because he got confronted at a CFR meeting in Chicago. Even CFR members, the establishment guys said, did you really say this? This is evil. And, and John Yu said, yes, we can. I mean, it seems like... I think they were worried that he was saying it out loud. <laughs> I don't understand. Their concern is, you know, listen, moron, if you're going to go crush people's hands, you don't announce that it's the policy... You know, I mean, these guys are like amateur torturers. But, I mean, kids, uh, his White House memo was, we can torture children in front of their parents, including, I don't want to say it again. The point is, is that that is Mingala stuff out in the open. That that does scare me at a certain level. It, it, it shocks me that it's so over the top. Yeah, well, and in fact, I think that, that some of the establishment, there is this internal battle we've talked about between neocons and big oil. Big oil wants a much more sophisticated approach. Uh, you know, I think they're getting a bit nervous about this stuff. And uh, that's why I was picking up out of Houston and out of New York from, you know, from the guys on the inside. That they are, they were not too happy about some of this cowboy stuff. That that's well, you can see the media for the first two years from after 9/11. They gave Bush carte blanche. They thought he was getting away. Okay, the plan's working. And I think as they saw things get crazier and crazier, now the media is allowed to say a little bit more on little side issues. Is that to weaken Bush? 
Yeah, I mean, well, one of the things is, is to give a shot to him and make sure he doesn't play too many games with the uh, with with the neocons. I mean, you know, after all, Paul Wolfowitz was basically demoted. I mean, he was kicked out of the war room where you know where they, the little t- Tinker Toy Napoleon would play with the toy tanks, and he was sent to be president of the World Bank, which in their world is a demotion. Of course, now as head of the World Bank, this guy is you know is is, is like. Uh, has just been absolutely totally monstrous. By the way, the New York Times had a glowing profile about how everyone loves him. I mean, you have <laughs> no idea. I mean, he he told uh, Ecuador if they didn't pay off these uh, these speculators, that he was just he was going <clears> to <throat> choke the economy to death. And we've got Bolton at the UN. I mean, these uh, what's wrong with these guys? Well, but keep in mind, from the CFR's view, from uh, was thrilled that that Wolfowitz has sent the World Bank and Bolton sent up to New York. As far as they're concerned, that was away from the centers of power. Well, I want to go to the calls because we're almost out of time, but but the last thing that I thought of, the Cheney shooting, we did an investigation on that. He clearly shot the guy up close. He clearly was drinking. They then had to admit it. If anybody else did that, they'd be in big trouble. They wouldn't let the police in. Uh, just give us in a nutshell your take on the whole Cheney shooting. Well, you know, it's, one of the problems is, I mean, I was down here. I'm going to be investigating that, by the way. Just so you know, I probably shouldn't even announce that on the air, but I'm going to get some more information. But all I do know is that absolutely, I mean, what the heck is this? Someone gets shot, and I don't care if the guy's vice president of the United States. What do we now have? Uh, we now allow personal executions by our, <laughs> by our by our leadership. I guess guns also write some type of law that says that, you know, that uh, as long as uh, the vice president is packing, whatever he does is, is okay. I mean, it's, it's gone completely bonkers. Well, just so you know, I've done a lot of bird hunting. Uh, he wasn't... Uh, the 90 feet away that they claim, because even with the most high-powered shotgun load, it doesn't go into the heart at that range. It, it, it might go in half an inch. So it, it's it's just total baloney. Uh, let's take a call here from Mike in New York. You're on the air with Greg Palast on Genesis. Oh, you guys got me all worked up now. Okay, Mike. Greg, here's the thing. Uh, pre uh, September 11th, my understanding is Breedis Corp out of Argentina he had to deal with the Taliban for taking the uh, oil pipeline through their country of Afghanistan. Unical. Yeah. Unical. Mm-hmm. Correct. And uh, obviously after September 11th, when I also understand that Unical was during that time frame was lobbying Congress. Yeah, I always call them Unical. That's the thing. It's, it's, it's like stuck in my head. Yeah, it's Unical. I guess know. it's like Unical, I guess, yeah. right? U-N-O-C-A-L? Yeah. They were lobbying Congress to establish some foreign policy because they actually wanted the deal. Obviously yes. September 11th came. British Corp's contract with the Taliban was null and void, obviously. And Unical won the day. They install, installed the uh, Karzai. I guess he was on the board with Unical. Yeah, he was on the board, and then he becomes the puppet president. Wow. That was all staged. Right. And keep in mind that the that the deal with, that was brokered between Unical and the Taliban was done brokered by um, uh, Khalilzad, who is now our the U.S. ambassador to Iraq. And when you say ambassador, you have to understand this guy is, is basically the, the dictator and overlord of What Iraq. about Ahmed Shalabi? He was at the Bilderberg Group meeting uh, last week. I mean, he can't even what go a to character. a bunch of countries because he's a convicted felon. Yeah, he's a convicted bank swindler. Convicted bank swindler. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, you know, he's wanted Interpol. I mean, this guy uh, took down the Petrus Bank. Uh, also, the when Chalabi, uh, that we installed, uh, named himself oil minister in, in Iraq. We're still trying to find out what happened to about a billion and a half to two billion dollars worth of oil. That That's right. I mean, there's just these are crooks. I, hey, listen, thanks for the call. I appreciate those fine points, Mike. Uh, let's talk to Shara, Sarah Joe in New York. Go ahead. You're on the air. Yes. Hi. First of all, um, I just want to, from the onset, state my position. I do not support Bush, but I'm rather tired of the idolization of Chavez. Mm-hmm. Um, anyone who's against Bush seems to be admired, and um, Chavez is not to be admired. I know you <coughs> supposedly had a meeting, or you had a meeting with him and mm-hmm. all, but um, I lived in Venezuela for many years. I have friends and family in Venezuela, at, even as we speak. The place is a mess. Chavez has done nothing except make it worse, okay? With other administrations, it wasn't the greatest. Well, but I mean, it is in such. Right. Well, well, listen, I'm not saying he's perfect, but he did give people back land that had been taken by oil companies. He's actually giving, with the deed, people their land. I mean, that that's... But he's a communist for that, but Bush is good with the Supreme Court ruling we don't own our private property. So I'm just trying to understand this. No, okay, so look, uh, let let me throw in, let me just respond here. Um, Number one, let's not fall in love with any politician anywhere. Uh, Obviously, Chavez is acting in his own interest, his own political interest. The, the fact is, and even uh, even the people who hate him and despise him down in Venezuela will say that he has turned those cardboard houses into brick-and-mortar houses and that people are, of all classes, are now way, way, way better off than they ever were. And the first time, for the first time ever, an oil, oil boom money is going back down to the people. 
Uh, does well, that let me mean just understand that, well, I mean, I mean, let me just understand this. What should we do? Should we maybe make Pat Robertson viceroy? I mean, uh, what, what should happen? You're saying that he's they elected him. You know that he's the elected president, and so therefore you have to recognize, for you know, for the United States to be to be uh, clearly, deliberately <coughs> trying to overthrow an elected president. And believe me, when I don't let let's get away from the the baloney that he wasn't elected. I went with his uh, opponent, the guy who's running against him for president. He's actually a nice guy. A guy named Julio Borges. I like his opponent a lot. Uh, but, you know, we went to a little town. We found one supporter. I went the next day to this very same town with the president. And you thought that Elvis had arrived, man. Ma'am, I mean, specifically, what's your point? What should happen? What are you saying? Well, what, you know? uh, the, the only thing I'm saying right now is that, like he said, Chavez is doing it for his own interest. And the people are not. They are taking land away from people. They're not giving them land and deeds. What they're doing is taking the, the people who live on the, in the shacks up on the hills. Yeah. They're illegal Colombians that came to that country of the past 40 to 50 years. See, this is what's going to happen in our country as soon as, you know, give it a few more years. And the people who have been working the land... Ma'am, okay, uh, explain it to me. What should be done? What are you saying? Well, I just think to give Chavez... You don't want to assassinate an elected president, do you? No, I'm not saying that, but you know, you say that they, they were not fair elections. I was down there for much of the uh, much of the uh, well, demonstrations. My, my I was point down is, there. I saw the whole country. My point is, is that it's making the globalists mad. Okay, and uh, I mean, our government loves China, and they got mobile execution vans and public executions and sell organs. So Chavez, compared to them, he's much better than China, and he's much better than our government. Thanks for the call. I pre do you agree with that statement? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, China. We are cuddling up to, to the most bloodthirsty dictators. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, North Korea is threatening to nuke us, and we're giving them reactors, and Rumsfeld's involved in that, of course. Mike in uh, California, you're on the air. Go ahead. Hi, guys. Hi. Uh, two questions: one for you, Greg; one for you, Alex. <clears throat> Greg, um, mm -hmm. w I what I hear and what I sense is that there's a an effort to consolidate South America so as to cause problems for the New World Order. Um, can you comment on that? And Alex, can you comment on, on this? Uh, I think I heard it on your show where they, somebody was saying that you were agreeing that World Vision, this Christian organization, as well as other leaders like Pat Robertson, John Hagee, others, are really not, uh, especially World Vision, being uh, operated by the CIA. Yes, I, I appreciate your call. Okay. A lot of them are paid off. A lot of them are co-opted. Uh, some of them are actual government operations. We have documents on that. Do you want to take that question and then, and then answer his first one? Okay. Well, the, the first question about what's happening in South America. Um, Hugo Chavez has said we have to end the dictatorship of the IMF. The, the IMF has got to go. And we have our so, own documents saying they want so, to overthrow right, countries. Right. So he's saying, you know, we can't operate this way where basically we're, we're being bled to death. Uh, but that means that he's had to take money out of the U.S. Federal Reserve and lent it into Argentina so that Argentina told the IMF to fly. He lent it to Ecuador. Ar uh, Ecuador told uh, the IMF to fly. And he's lending, in other words, he's replacing the IMF with his nation's oil money. Now, they're not doing badly because what happens is these nations, he lends the money to these nations and they get up off the ground. He's actually made like 70 million bucks for his And so they're getting the into. The, right. They're, they're getting independent into, then. You know, I mean. What about so, uh, uh, using fake conservative Christian groups as okay. government fronts? Well, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the other thing. So, you know, I, I uh, met with Pat Robertson. And I wore a wire then too. Uh, got it around. By the way, the way I got around his metal detector, I told his guard, I said, could you hold my lighter for me? It'll just set off the alarm. <laughs> and he gave it back to me the other side. He didn't notice I didn't have any cigarettes, you know. Yeah, I just, yeah. But you know, so uh, but you know, so Robertson told me, it's on tape. I'm not a televangelist. I'm a businessman. This is business, man. This is all about the money. He owned at one time like 30 TV stations, networks. Oh, I mean, the guy's know, billions. Yeah, you know, at least I figure he's worth a good half billion anyway. I mean, this guy, there is no. No, I mean his assets money. are billions. Yeah, I mean it's huge and. Um, and he's got, you know, diamond mine operating out of the Congo. With you slaves. You, know, you can't do that stuff. You can't cut deals with guys like Mobutu without having CIA support. Hey, we're out of time, Greg Palace. The new book, Arm Madhouse, already on the New York Times hey. bestseller list in stores everywhere. I want to carry it. I appreciate you coming on with us. It's always great. And next time you kind of orbit through our area, I want to have you back in studio again, Greg. You got it, Alex. That was great. I think we covered a lot of the bases. Sorry, callers. I'll come back and go to you after the break. 1-800-259-9231. Greg, again. Good seeing you. You're the man, Alex. No, no. You're the man. We'll be right back. <laughs>
Well, we're live, ladies and gentlemen. Now eight minutes and 30 seconds into this second hour, and I've had a chance to meet him in New York and interview him for my film, Martial Law. He was gracious enough to give us a few hours then, and I've had him on the radio with us many, many uh, times over the years, breaking big stories uh, that he's always gracious enough to bring us. And he was here over the weekend uh, speaking to a uh, standing room only crowd about his new book that just came out and is already on the New York Times bestseller list. It's Greg Palast, Armed Madhouse, Who's Afraid of Osama Wolf, China Floats, Bush Sinks, The Scheme to Steal 08, No Child Behind Left. And it also is a uh, handsome book. I just got it and I can't wait to read it. Greg is uh, an extremely accomplished uh, writer, again, best selling author joining us in studio. We're also videotaping this for the local TV show and the PrisonPlanet.tv viewers. Greg Powell, it's great to have you here with us. Terrific, Alex. It's always an honor, really. Imposed by the State Department, but written up by Big Oil. I've got here um, the inside documents from Choice Point and the companies which are illegally, you know, um, sucking up uh, information about you and me and, and renting it out to the government. Uh, so you, you have like 60 illustrations in this beast because it's all these documents marked secret and confidential you're not supposed to see. And BBC will actually allow me to go get them, but they won't allow me to show it on US TV. I am completely, totally locked out of uh, American uh, television. Well, this is smoking gun type stuff that yep. you have. You've done a lot of the original research on this. It's been confirmed. It's been vetted. Right. Uh, this is the same stuff that the Treasury Secretary O'Neill was telling us. Then you actually get the documents. Right. This is this is war profiteering in the extreme. This is serious crime, in my opinion. And 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 historically, we have that precedent. You have the oil companies writing up the oil policy for the Iraqi government to basically then hand it over to them, proving that one of the pillars of this invasion uh, is about snatching trillions of dollars in oil and controlling it. See, one of the weird things is, and one of the horrible things is. I got two documents. A lot of, you know, they say, oh, conspiracy nuts think that Bush had a secret plan to seize and control the oil fields of Iraq before the invasion and, uh, be, and even before uh, September 11th. And that's not true, Alex, because I looked it up and we dug it out and we found out he had two plans. And the two plans, one written up by neocons, one written up by big oil. And the big oil plan, which is the one that ultimately won out, is not about, believe it or not, it's not about going to get the oil. It's not about blood for oil, it's about blood for no oil. They're not going in there to get you the oil to make it cheap to fill your Hummer. They are going in. They're using the 82nd Airborne as uh, Exxon's exploration company, not to find oil and bring it back, but to find oil and turn off the spigots. You read, I had a 323-page document written by up by Big Oil and the James Baker III Institute, Council on Foreign Relations. I know that a lot of people say, oh, this is conspiracy stuff. You have to understand. I found out these guys wrote up our policy because they told me themselves, the oil execs themselves, and the James Baker people. If you don't know who James Baker is, he was Secretary of State under Bush one, Treasury Secretary under Ronald Reagan. He represents, he's the lawyer for Exxon Mobil, the lawyer for the Saudi Arabian government, and the lawyer kind of consigliere for the Bush family. And it's his crew that put this together. Now they say that they didn't put it together. Uh, or they said they didn't even talk to me. but And they threatened to sue, by the way, Harper's Magazine when I outed this stuff. Then the editor of Harper's said, you never talked to Palace? They said, that's right. And they said, okay, what part of this audio tape is not you? Because that's one thing I do. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was on, on National uh, Public Radio, NPR, which are better called National Petroleum Radio. And they said, we don't do that. I said, I know that. But I have to. You know what? You talk to these guys, they lie. So they didn't know who they were talking to or why, and they let the stuff out. When I got the word about the oil companies drafting up the plans for Iraq's oil fields right out of Houston, even though it says Washington, I mean, you know, my, uh, my big shot publishers out of New York, I say, I want to launch my book on the Alex Jones show. And they go, well, it's Alex Jones. You know, like they're in the New York Towers. They don't understand what the people are listening to. So that's why even they are surprised that my book is a bestseller again. Uh, you know, so thank you, Alex, because you're getting that word out. Oh, no, thank you, Greg. You uh, certainly have a huge grassroots support all over the globe. Tell us, tell us about Armed Madhouse. Well, I mean, it starts out like who's afraid of Osama Wolf. You go from, you go from um, the war on terror to Iraq to Venezuela um, to China and what's going on uh, with all this stuff. What I'm doing is, for those who don't know me, I do um, investigative reporting. 
for BBC Television, which, you know, Alex is, uh, you know, I have to do over there because investigative reporting here is, I think, against Patriot Act 3 or something. They don't allow this stuff on the air. What I've got here, for example, are the secret uh, plans for the oil fields of Iraq, which I was able to get out of Houston, uh, which are written for the Iraqi government, 